Hi, I'm Carl Barks, the Duck Man. I suppose some of you people have heard of me, especially if you have read some of my stories about Donald Duck, and Uncle Scrooge, and the Beagle Boys. Well, I wrote those comic book stories for 23 years. I wrote about 500 of them. So I imagine you have uh, an idea that I must be some sort of an odd character to have ever created those many characters. And uh, you'll find by looking at this tape that I am pretty much of an odd character. Carl, how, how was it that uh, your family became uh, located in Merrill, Oregon? <laughs> well, that was uh, before my time, but my father was, of course, like all uh, young bachelors in those days, looking for some free land so he could start a farm of his own. And so he heard about the homestead land in the sagebrush country up in eastern Oregon, and he left his job in, as a blacksmith in the big uh, grain ranches in southern, well, central California, and he went up to Oregon and located a 160 acres that nobody was on, and it looked like it's good level land and good soil, and he established a claim on that. Was that in the 1880s? That was in, yeah, that was in the 1880s. I don't know just what year in the 1880s, but it, it was a long time ago. When you came along in 1901, um, were you born in a hospital? I was born in a little two-room shack that they had on the farm. It had become a farm by then. This. It grubbed out the sagebrush and grown crops of wheat and rye. And this little two-room shack had uh, a stove and a uh, table in one room and a bed and oh, chairs, I guess, or so in the other room. And you were born right there? I was born there. Did you? Did your father eventually build a house on the property? Or? He built a larger house, oh, I guess about 1903, sometime like that. He built a larger house. It was a two-story house with three, four bedrooms. Do you remember any uh, humorous things as a child when you were growing up? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <you> Humor? <laughs> It was a grim life. We didn't take time to laugh about anything. <laughs> it was pretty serious. Many people are fascinated with a one-room schoolhouse. Could you tell us about that? Well, uh, one-room schoolhouses were the thing in those days because there were uh, no motorized buses and people lived far apart. And uh, a one-room schoolhouse is very practical because we're in an area where there were, say, 10 families living, there would be a number of children who would be in the first grade, just little ones. And then there would be some who were in uh, the third and fourth grade, and a very few who were larger. So there was all this variety of children maybe 15 children going to this one-room schoolhouse, and the teacher would teach all the different grades. He would teach the little primary grades, and, and we could all hear what was going on in the rest of the schoolhouse because it's just one big room, and uh, we, could, we in the older grades could watch the little kids learning how to write on the blackboard and I guess the little kids learn something by watching us older kids write on the blackboard. So it was a very practical system. I think they should have more of that now. It seems that your, your life was really pretty hard in those days, uh, plowing the fields and uh, riding a horse into the one-room schoolhouse. And people are curious to uh, where that wonderful sense of humor comes from. 
I don't know where it came from. I don't think I ever laughed until I was about 50 years old. Oh, I was a real sourpuss all of those years. You were a pretty serious student, you think? Oh, I was a serious student. Yes, I, I shined in arithmetic and history and oh, geography was another I liked. The serious subjects. I didn't care much for the English grammar. It was too difficult for me to <laughs> solve the riddle of adjectives and adverbs and sentence structures. Could you tell us a little bit about the uh, work on the farm? Well, the work on the farm was from the time you got up in the morning until uh, it was dark at night. Uh, you, you lived uh, by the uh, same life pattern that the chickens have. You get up at daylight and go to bed at sundown. Do you have memories of plowing the field or? Oh, I have <laughs> memories of it, yes. There was something nice about sitting on a plow. The, the riding type plow was very pleasant. You sat there and you will watch the plowshare shearing through the ground and turning over the sod. And there was something nice about that. Of course, I had to drive a team of horses pulling that plow. It would have been so much more pleasant to have had one of those nice air-conditioned tractors that they have nowadays. Did your family support you uh, in your desire to be a cartoonist? Oh, well, yes, they did. Uh, it kept me out of uh, mischief, I guess. Not that I would have gotten into any way. I was a good, obedient kid. Do you remember the first comic book strip that you read? Uh, it must have been Little Nemo. Uh, the San Francisco Examiner, which we got once a week, had all the comic strips in the, the pages, and they were in color, if I remember right, and that's the one that I remember most clearly. You seem to have a long list of uh, occupations when you left the farm. Kind of reminds me of Donald Duck's occupations. Uh, <laughs> what occupations were those? Well, I, I uh, worked uh, one summer in the logging woods as a logger, and then I picked uh, grapes in the vineyards in Southern California, and I got work in the railroad yards and working in the railroad car shops for several years, and I worked in a sawmill, and I did a little carpenter work, and uh, just about anything that was hard physical labor that paid very small wages. How did it come about that you sold your first cartoon? Well, it came about because at that time I was working in uh, railroad car shops on a riveting gang and I hated the work very much and I had always been practicing cartooning and I saw a magazine uh, publishing pictures, uh, hand-drawn pictures by artists that I knew were no better at their trade than I was. So I drew a few cartoons that put little jokes on them, little punchlines, and sent them to a magazine called the Calgary Eye Opener. And uh, they bought one of the pictures, but they didn't buy <laughs> any of my jokes. However, I got, uh, it was either $2 or $3 for that little picture. Well, right away, I could just envision myself getting rich as an artist, and 
From that time on, I concentrated very much on learning to draw better and better and think of jokes that would sell. And I was beginning to sell art fast enough that it was feeling pretty good. So you were a freelancer for a while? I was a freelancer, yes. That was through, oh, 1928, 1929. I was selling quite a few pictures and jokes. How'd you ever end up in Minneapolis? Well, uh, I was selling most of my stuff to this Calgary Eye Opener in Minneapolis. And I, uh, I had reached a point where I was putting more stuff into the magazine than anybody else. And when they had some editorial trouble with the uh, the editor was not uh, appearing on the job often enough why they fired him and asked if I would come back there and uh, take over as a part-time uh, assistant editor and staff writer. So they sent me money enough to come back there on the train and I did it. Well then how did you end up going from Minneapolis to Burbank? I. Um, was and uh, I knew that the magazine was not going to succeed for very long. And I was trying to develop a writing style by which I might be able to sell cartoons to magazines in New York, uh, like College Humor and Esquire, magazines like that. But I didn't have time to do that, and I saw an a, a article in the newspaper that said Walt Disney's was hiring artists out at the studio, and uh, they required sample drawings. So I sent some sample drawings to Walt Disney's, and I was told to come out and go to work. I guess in 1935 and 1936 that you had some uh, pretty famous Disney people in your art classes. In uh, those years, there was a very good crop of beginners came to work at Disney. They, once each month, there was a, about nine or ten artists selected from various parts of the country to come and try out at Disney's in the animation department. And that is where uh, the nine old men came from. There may have been one or two of the nine old men who were already at Disney's, but here came Mark Davis and Phil Duncan and Hugh Fraser, and Eric Larson, a whole bunch of extremely good artists who became the great artists that drew Pinocchio and Fantasia and all those great pictures that followed. I was not one of those. <laughs> I, I started out in the in-betweens and I very quickly found out that it was not my cup of tea. But I uh, submitted so many good gags to the story department that Walt decided I belonged in the story department. So did I ever feel good, though, when they moved me to the story department? And I started in there at $65 a week. I would have been getting 20 if I had stayed on in the in-betweens. I understand that quite frequently you were able to get Walt Disney to do things your way. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, when he would come in on uh, story conferences, he would uh, let us show what we had on uh, storyboards and argue a point or two with him about the merits of some particular gig. He would uh, let us tell our side of it and 
and listen politely and even give us uh, the last word in the argument, which was always, yes, Walt. Did he seem to have a knack for storytelling? Oh, yes. Yes, he would right away pick out whether we had the knack, too. He'd quickly decide whether the story was moving the right way. And if it wasn't, he would tell us the right way it should move. And uh, after the story conference, why, he would either tell us to shelve the story or keep on with it and, and make some changes, and then he would be back later to see it. Do you think he could have been an artist himself? He certainly could have. Perhaps he just didn't like the physical part of drawing. He could visualize the most magnificent pictures in his head, but the hard work of changing that mental image to something on a piece of paper was, it took too much of his time, I think. He was just too busy to do that kind of work, and he could hire somebody to do it. He had a reputation, uh, uh, other than being a genius, for being a really hard worker. Did you see that? Oh, yes. Yes, I don't think he... Uh, he had a reputation for going and playing polo and such things, but I don't think he was playing polo. I think he was thinking up gags while he was riding around on that horse. In the first uh, Donald Duck Adventure comic book, um, how did that happen that you and Jack Hanna worked on that together? Well, that happened because somebody from Western Publishing Company came out to Disney's to see if they had any material that would make a long story for a full-length comic book. And uh, they had had a crew working for a while on the story. Uh, it was to be Mickey and Goofy, I believe, uh, looking for pirate gold. And they had this parrot in there. And it was very much the same formula as was adapted in, made into a, a movie or a comic book story about Donald. And when they, these, Western publishing people saw that, they said that would make an awfully good story if some of the writers and artists there at Disney could make a story script of that that would fit comic book format and have some artists draw it why they would like to make a comic book of it. So it happened that Bob Carp, who worked in the comic strip department, wrote the story script, and I drew half of the drawings, and Jack Hanna drew the other half, and it turned out to be a very successful story called Pirate Gold. It was so successful that even Disney's took an interest in seeing comic books being produced. After seven years at the Disney studio, uh, somehow you became a went from being an air-conditioned artist to being a, a non-air-conditioned chicken farmer. How did that happen? <laughs> well, that happened because I got to where I could hardly breathe in the air conditioning in the studio. My uh, mucous membranes in my nose all closed up and I couldn't breathe except through my mouth and I had awful hay fever all the time. And after I got out to uh, San Jacinto, where the sun was hot day and night, and I was raising chickens, so I, my health came back to where I felt real good again. And that's how I got out there. And after uh, I'd been there a short time, I heard from somebody working at Disney's in the uh, licensing division. I can't remember her name now, but she wrote me a note saying that 
the people at Western Publishing were going to try an original Donald Duck story for uh, their comic book, the first of the Walt Di first of the Walt Disney comics and stories that would carry a ten-page opening story about Donald, and would I be willing to draw it? And I said, yes, I sure would. So the people at Western Publishing <laughs> sent me a script, and I drew it, but it, the script looked so, uh, it didn't tell the story right. And having had four years experience, or six years experience writing stories at Disney's, I knew how a story should be put together, and I made some changes in it. And when they read that story at the publishing house and realized that I had changed it and made it better, they were so astonished, they told me to go ahead and do the writing after that, that I could write my own stories. Was that that famous Victory Garden story? That was the Victory Garden story, yes. I changed it around and changed scenes and timing in that to where it, it finally made some sense. There's another famous uh, uh, comic book story that you did about uh, Pleasant Valley that turned into uh, the town of Omelette. <laughs> Was that related in any way to any humor that might have been going on at your chicken ranch? Well, I uh, found out enough about chickens and eggs uh, running that chicken ranch that I <laughs> could see a lot of humorous possibilities. But uh, writing those stories for the comic books was just a matter of trying to think of some situation that would fill 10 pages of good humor, good stories with a beginning and a middle and an end that all made some sense and hooked together. And I could see enough material in a Donald having a chicken ranch, how many mistakes he could make, and uh, I put it together, and it was a very funny story, it, as it turned out. I could not have worked that story with Mickey running the chicken ranch. I'm sure it would never have worked with Goofy running the chicken ranch. It was just Donald and his <laughs> bravado and his brassiness that made the story successful. But how did it come that you, when you'd uh, come about when you'd use a new character? Well, so often when I was writing those stories, I would think of some story that Donald and the kids could get into, some situation that would be awfully funny, but they needed somebody else in there. They had to have somebody for a foil, uh, a merchant, or a sea captain, or somebody who could be the goat for their adventures. Therefore, I was always inventing new characters uh, to help make the story interesting and help uh, Donald and the kids have enough to do. How did it come about that you uh, created the word Duckburg? Oh, well, that came about just out of necessity. I couldn't uh, mention the Disney studio being the residence of all these people. And I finally just thought, well, why not just call it Duckburg because that's where the ducks live. What Their kind of, little village. What kind of a place was Duckburg? <laughs> it changed every time I had a story. It was a village. It was a big city. It was a city on the ocean and a city in the desert. It was wherever I needed it. I was reading a story just the other day of where they had a big lighthouse that was situated on Cape Quack. And that would have been strictly in New England, way back in Massachusetts or Maine. <laughs> Yet that was where Duckburg was. 
It's interesting to people that Duckburg uh, seems so changeable and moves around. It seemed that the money bin moved around too. Sometimes it'd be downtown or sometimes it'd be well, a lake. Uh, well, that's right. I, I generally put it up on a, a rise of ground so that it stood out above the other buildings around there, but I certainly did put a variety of buildings around the money bin. I never had any particular formula for drawing those things. <laughs> if you looked at those stories critically, you could find an awful lot of changes made in Duckburg. What kind of a person is Donald Duck? I wouldn't call him a person. <laughs> Oh, Donald is, uh, uh, he is any person he is required to be to fill some particular situation in a story. So perhaps he is an actor. I have to think of him as an actor. You've had a joke that uh, you love uh, Louis but hate Huey, but... Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the personalities the, of the nephews and how they changed over the years? Well, the nephews started out at the studio just being brats, who were just mischievous brats who were almost mean, you might say, in the vindictive things they could think of and tricks they could play on Uncle Donald and and all, and I changed them in my stories. I made them so that they thought of a lot of tricks that were good tricks, which they foiled somebody like Donald when he was doing something he shouldn't do. They would come up with a good trick that would uh, foil him. And, and so they, they became uh, the brains of the place, not Donald. You tell us a little bit about the Junior Woodchuck Manual. <laughs> well, the Junior Woodchuck Manual is the most magical book in the world. It has all the knowledge in the world. And the, the, it must be very small because they carry it around in, in the pocket and you never can see a pocket on those little tight sweaters they wear, so it, it must be a book that's not much bigger than a postage stamp, but it contains an awful lot of knowledge. Who, who are the Junior Woodchucks of the world? Well, they are uh, a club, a sort of a paramilitary club that they have their uh, meetings and, and they're patterned a little bit after the Boy Scouts. Could you describe Gyro Gearloose for us? Well, Gyro Gearloose is uh, Thomas A. Edison with a chicken beak, except that old um, Gyro, he makes up inventions that are not quite as practical as Edison's inventions, but uh, he always trying to think of something that'll make a real good, beneficial thing for the human race. And he always boggles it one way or another. Anyway, he is a, a comic inventor that all cartoonists should keep in their stable. That little helper, the light bulb man that came on a couple years after Gyro uh, was sure a funny little character. Well, uh, I first invented him just to have something to put in the panels with gyro. It looks so stiff and dead to me to have gyro working on some complex invention and just talking to himself in thought balloons and nothing to look at in there except just gyro and his the whatever he was working on. And sometimes those things required such long development that uh, the panels began to drag. So I thought, well, 
there has to be something in these panels besides gyro that will let people have more time to look at each panel. And I put this little helper in there. I first had the little helper just sort of standing around or sitting on Gyro's shoulder or something like that to uh, create a bit of interest. Then I began inventing things for the helper to do. So that while Gyro was up in the middle part of the picture, the little helper's down in a corner in big adventures by himself. And it, he caught on and people liked him very much. I'm sure that within a two or three more years, they would have had to have had a, a comic book in which he was the star <laughs> actor. In 1947, uh, in the comic book uh, Christmas uh, on Bear Mountain, we were treated to seeing Uncle Scrooge for the first time. How did you think of him? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I thought of him as uh, just a typical old miser. And I think one of the first thoughts I had of him was of, oh, miser grew up in his money. He just loved the feel of this stuff. And I guess that whole character just came to me in a flash like that. And that's the way I built him from that time on except I would change him once in a while and give him a soft spot. But, but uh, that's the way I first visualized him, the way I used him in his first story, first view of him. He was just an old miser sitting in his chair on Christmas, and he knew that everybody hated him, and he hated everybody. <laughs> Got all the money he needed to let the other people go to hell. <laughs> what is the relationship between Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge? The relationship is, uh, I guess it changes from time to time, but it seems to have kind of boiled down to where Uncle Scrooge Uncle Scrooge uses Donald as a sort of a helper and someone he can depend on whenever he needs to have help. He can always depend on Donald and the kids to work for him. And I think he trusts them to be his friend in any situation he gets into. And Donald and the kids treat Uncle Scrooge as if he's, uh, he's a little bit wacky. He's got all this crazy idea about making money, but they will go along and help him just because he's their uncle. How about the relationship between Donald Duck and the kids, Huey, Dewey, and Louie? Well, that too changed from time to time. At times I've had Donald be quite a loving parent and at other times a, a real stern parent. He's, he's got those kids and he's going to raise them and come what may, he's going to do it. Now I think I show Donald as being a responsible type of parent to those kids, even though they appear to be much smarter than him. Seems in the later years when the junior woodchucks are in full force that the Huey, Dewey, and Louie actually become more like the parents as the they, bright ones. They <laughs> become like Donald's advisors, Donald's parents. <laughs> they raised that boy. <laughs> What is the relationship with uh, Donald, or pardon me, Uncle Scrooge and the Beagle Boys? Oh, well, there again, that is simple. They're just a bunch of thieves trying to get his money, and he's trying to figure out ways to keep them from getting it. That uh, rivalry between those two provided 
material for a great many stories. Could you tell us a little bit about this figurine, this bronze statue of Uncle Scrooge who's diving in his money? That uh, bronze comes about from the fact that early on in the comics, I showed Uncle Scrooge diving around in his money, and it made a great hit, evidently, with people. And uh, now, after all these years, people still are fascinated with the old boy and his method of playing with money. And this pose of Scrooge diving is in several stories. And uh, a sculptor in Anaheim, I believe it was, made the figure of this and cast it in bronze, and it has become very successful. Who was it that said, no man is poor who can do what he wants to do once in a while? Well, that was uh, something I made up to justify Uncle Scrooge's way of constantly saving money, and all while it never brings him any great fun, or he has no other fun in life than just diving around in that money. He said that uh, no man is poor who can uh, do what he wants to do once in a while. Were there, um, you had such a, uh, a variety of stories. Uh, uh, how did you get the idea for such diverse stories? Uh, well, you, in doing that work, you had to get a variety. You just had to get new, unusual story plots, because that's what sold the books. It was just a matter of necessity. Write good stories, write fresh, new ideas, write complex things that you make it look simple. <laughs> Your stories seem to have uh, such a knack for keeping the words down to a minimum and, and having the exact meaning that you were looking for. I know it. Uh, that is one of the secrets of timing. When you read the story, if it's got so much dialogue in the dialogue balloons that you bogged down reading that dialogue so that when you turn to the next panel, you've forgotten where the characters were in the previous panel. The dialogue just takes over the story, and when you've finished, you have a tired feeling from reading. So I put that dialogue, cut it down as short as I could, told as much of the story as I could, with drawing, and uh, I would read the dialogue over and over, and there is a trick to making a quick changeover in dialogue by just counting the syllables. If you've got a word that's got too many syllables in it and it kind of slows the whole sentence down, change that word. I would go into dialogue balloons and just analyze them down to the last syllable so that just count it out to almost like reading music. It seems like some of your climaxes would be just built up to a crescendo. That's right, yes. Was it frequent that you'd, you would put um, just one climax or one major happening uh, per story? Uh, well, on a short story, a ten-page story, there shouldn't be more than one good, strong climax. But the, uh, there should be two or three other pretty darn good wallops in there on the way up. In your adventure stories, uh, you seem to have a wonderful knack of teaching kids things about foreign lands without preaching. 
Well, that was all part of making a story interesting. Uh, look, make the country look like the country where they are. If they're in Asia, make it look like some part of Asia. And I would look for background material in travel magazines, and geographic and places like that. No, I tried to get the sincerity and the feeling of reality into my stories. I believe it paid off. Your comic book covers had such a, a nice symmetry. Uh, was this the beginning uh, of laying out symmetry for your oil paintings? Well, yes, in a way it was. That uh, symmetrical conciseness you see in the covers, well, I was told how to do those covers by the art editors down at the publishing outfit. The first few I did, they sent me a rough sketch of exactly the proportions that I had to draw those ducks, always with the duck's head so big. The duck, uh, like Donald's head, would need to take up, I think, uh, almost one quarter or one fifth of the area of the cover, exclusive of the title. So I had to uh, learn to cram an awful lot of stuff into a very little space and accentuate the duck's heads. I didn't carry that part of it over into my paintings, though. In my paintings, the ducks were all proper proportions. But I did realize that all those things had to be followed. The Everything you need to show has to be so clearly delineated and colored and accentuated so that you see it with one quick glance. When you look at the painting, you see it all right there. Well, for years you were able to maintain a solitude, but was it Esther Williams who first wrote you as a, a fan letter? No, I got a fan letter from a young kid in Aptos, California. He, he wrote uh, quite a long fan letter to me about how great my stuff was. I didn't believe it. I thought it was a joke on me by some of the fellows who worked for Hank Ketchum doing the gags for uh, Dennis the Menace. They lived up at uh, Carmel, which was very close there, and I thought, oh, that's just some trick they did. They composed this fan letter and mailed it in Aptus and said they were this guy, this this phony guy that had written this letter. And it turned out that it was a real letter. I guess officially it was Malcolm Willits who came up and met you uh, yeah, personally. Yeah, he was the first fan that I ever met personally, yes. Have you ever seen Malcolm since those years? Oh, quite often. Oh, there are, of course, many years by that I don't see him, but I've seen him in quite a few places in the world since then. He, he gets around. He's a very successful collector and promoter of duckisms. Hi, I'm Malcolm Willits here in Hollywood, California, and I own the Collector's Bookstore at Hollywood and Vine, which mostly sells movie memorabilia. But in the past, we have sold a good bit of Carl Barks material, too. And uh, actually, I'm one of Carl's oldest fans because I first began reading his work in 1942, and that's when he began his work, was in 1942. And I started collecting it in 1945. And believe me, in 1945, uh, no young boy uh, was expected to collect Walt Disney material. It just wasn't done. I think one thing interesting about Carl Barks is that his stories many people feel are timeless. That means they're as good today as they were 50 years ago and probably be just as good 50 years from now. For instance, even during World War II, 
when a lot of the other comic strip artists and comic book artists were writing propaganda stories about the evil Nazis and uh, bombing the Japanese and everything, Carl was in a world of his own. His stories dealt with everyday problems connected with just with living. Somehow I feel uh, Karl Barks is one of the few who has really given a positive image of the United States throughout the world. And uh, that's one of the best things I think he's done, and he's done it through the realm of comic books. What do you think about all these people that are analyzing your stories and looking for hidden meanings? I think they, uh, they must have uh, something better to do. <laughs> The, uh, the stories were just fairy stories. They were just stories put together for a bunch of gags. There was no real deep meaning in any of them. But they uh, like to claim they find some deep meaning. They must have thought I was a tremendous intellectual. And I never had time to be one, even if I could have. There's a whole series of uh, non-Disney uh, ducks and uh, non-Disney oil paintings. Uh, how did those come about? Well, when I didn't have permission to paint the Disney ducks, I had to paint subjects of my own invention. And I, I painted some cowboy scenes, and I painted little landscapes, and. Uh, various things that I thought would sell. Very few of them ever sold. But Who is Billy the Duckling? Well, those were some watercolors I did that they, they sold. They sold very well. The little watercolors of uh, famous figures of history, as they might have looked, had their genes gotten mixed with waterfowl. That was the excuse I had for putting duck bills on human faces. And that what people seemed to want, the people who wanted those watercolors wanted me to make them look like ducks, but they could be human in all other respects. <laughs> so that was how I got into that deal, and they were successful. I hope to see a book published of those little watercolors. They had a lot of sarcasm and humor in them. We hear a lot of reports lately about people fighting over your Disney oil paintings with money and uh, the, pi the, the prices seem to be just getting extremely high. Uh, we hear $200,000 a couple of times over. And um, What was the original prices of those paintings back in the 70s? Well, I started my paintings at $150, and I was quite timid asking $150, because I thought maybe the guy would give me 50 for it. <laughs> but it came out that he was glad to get it for $150, and so I painted quite a number in $150 that now sell for several thousand. Uh, as far as the prices going up and up, uh, $200,000 for a painting, you know, that just whets my appetite. And I think, suppose we could get some of those big Japanese computer millionaires to come over here and buy my paintings. Maybe they'd pay a million for one of them. Ah, I just get like Uncle Scrooge, I think. Ah, got something good going here. <laughs> My specialty in the field of Karl Barks's art is with the original drawings, the original ink drawings and pencil drawings that he created in the production of the comic book stories. The original works that Karl did in actual production of the comic book stories have also become much more in demand than they were when they first started to appear on the market 30 years ago. These original ink drawings will sell for between five and ten thousand dollars a piece and they in a sense are more interesting to a certain kind of collector the collector who is fascinated with the work of Karl Barks oftentimes 
began reading the comic book stories. And this is the medium to which that collector always returns. And to have an original work, an ink drawing on paper or a pencil sketch on paper, that Carl actually created when he was producing one of these comic book stories is very special to that kind of collector. What do you think about the violent comics of today? I, I'm afraid they've gone a little too far with that violence and, and men with stupendous muscles. And uh, in the superhero comics, they have uh, gotten completely away from the human race into a bunch of mutants that are uh, no interest to living people. How would you compare the giant Walt Disney Company of today with the small Walt Disney Company that you worked for in the 30s? Oh, it is no longer the same company. The, in the 30s, it was a one-man company. It was Walt and his brother Roy holding on to Walt's purse strings that uh, made a company. And uh, it was uh, an operation that was simple from the top to the bottom. Every, everything moved along the lines of thought of one man. Now it is a scatterated company with vice presidents in every direction. But it is the only way that the Walt Disney Company as it stands now could compete in this world in which all companies are like that. They have a very good operation there at Disney's now. And it's composed of uh, a lot of guys who know how to operate as a group. What is the future of comic books with all the modern things going on, internet and uh, the different games on TV and the, all the modern technology? I am very much scared that comics don't have a very good future. There will have to be a cycle in which reader interest goes back to reading again. Right now, it seems that everybody's mind is caught up on these new games that come on television and things that you can get by pressing a button and watching a monitor. Uh, pretty soon the mind will tire of those things and perhaps will go back to reading. The, the wonderful thought of being alone with your thoughts and having something in your hand that you can just read and, and enjoy rather than having to sit in front of a, a uh, television monitor looking at somebody else's stuff moving around on the screen. You're just a spectator. You're not doing anything to help yourself understand what's going on. I think the, uh, the fans would like to know a little bit about your particular way of drawing. Um, do you, for instance, do uh, uh, worksheets before you draw, or do you draw it out in a blue pencil? Oh, I drew everything. For the comic books, I drew directly onto the drawing paper. Uh, I drew in blue pencil because blue pencil will not pick up on uh, engravers' um, films or solution. So I drew in blue pencil and worked out all the compositions right on the drawing paper, panel by panel, even laid out my dialogue in blue pencil. And uh, when I had gotten that nice and tight and ready to go, I got out my pen and inked it. Uh, with the other artists, a great many of them did their sketches on a piece of transparent paper, tr copy tracing paper, drew their rough sketches. Then they put that transparent paper on a light board with a light under it, 
and put their drawing paper over the top of that rough drawing that was illuminated, and they could see the lines of the drawing through the drawing paper, and they inked on top of that, made nice, clean inking. You saw none of the construction lines, but it was just too much work for me, and I, I liked the old way of doing it. And my principal tool was an eraser. I used that more than I did my pencils. <laughs> Carl, I'm holding in my hand a, what looks to be a figurine. It says, Carl Barks Lifetime Achievement Award, 1993. What is this? That is a, a figurine that I made, or at least I designed it, for an award given out by a big comic distributor who has a convention every year in which he gives out awards for excellence in various forms of comic book work. And this Barkster, this Barkster is the, is the award that goes for excellence in inking or in story work or in art, many of the various things that, that make comic books great, and they call it the Barkster, which is quite an honor, because my stories over 20-some years had supposedly never lost their quality. Carl, I'm going to ask you some short questions, and uh, just say whatever comes to your mind first. In what years would have the money have been, been erected? It would have been built possibly back in the early 1920s. What qualities do you most appreciate in a man? Well, honesty. And what qualities do you most appreciate in a woman? Beauty and brains. And your favorite virtue? Well, that would be honesty and sincerity. What is your dream of happiness? Well, I would say uh, it would always be a dream because I can't think of anything that would make me happier than just being a guy drawing ducks. And uh, what is your present mental state? Uh, <laughs> I think I need to see a psychiatrist right away. Do you have a motto? Yes, I have a motto. It's do unto others as you would have them do to you. Carl, when you uh, began inventing Duckburg, did you ever dream that you would pr uh, provide work for just hundreds and hundreds of people printing 20 million comic books a month? I had no idea that that would happen, but I'm certainly glad it did. I think it is wonderful that the ducks became so popular all over the world that they uh, made jobs for many more artists and writers, made jobs for publishers, and uh, have become quite an industry. I am very glad to see that happen. Do you have any special messages for your uh, comic book fans? Well, I, my special message is that I admire their taste very much, and I hope that they always find the duck comics so good that they won't read anything else. <laughs>